Well, people of God, at this time, let me invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to Genesis chapter 46. Genesis chapter 46, we're going to start reading at verse 31 and, three, and read through the entirety of Genesis 47. And uh, you should be able to find that on page 49 in one of your pew Bibles. You likely will want to keep your copy of God's Word open. I always encourage that, but especially when we do a large section, which we are doing this morning, uh, all of chapter 47 and some of 46. We're not going to be able to reread much of that, though we will be able to easily summarize most of it. Uh, so we will be taking a large section this morning. So let us pick up the narrative at verse 31 of Genesis 46. And as always, I remind you, this is the living Word of God. Then Joseph said to his brothers and his father's household, I will go up and speak to Pharaoh and will say to him, My brothers and my father's household who were living in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds, they tend livestock, and they have brought along their flocks and herds and everything they own. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks you what is your occupation, you should answer, Your servants have tended livestock from our boyhood on, just as our fathers did. Then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen, for all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. Joseph went and told Pharaoh, My father and brothers with their flocks and herds and everything they own have come from the land of Canaan and are now in Goshen. He chose five of his brothers and presented them before Pharaoh. Pharaoh asked the brothers, What is your occupation? Your servants are shepherds, they replied to Pharaoh, just as our fathers were. He also said to him, We have come to live here a while because the famine is severe in Canaan and your servants' flocks have no pasture. So now please let your servants settle in Goshen. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you and the land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen. And if you know of any among them with special ability, put them in charge of my own livestock. And Joseph brought his father Jacob in and presented him before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty. My years have been few and difficult, and they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my father's. Then Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers in Egypt and gave them property in the best part of the land, the district of Ramses, as Pharaoh directed. Joseph also provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to the number of their children. There was no food, however, in the whole region because the famine was severe. Both Egypt and Canaan wasted away because of the famine. Joseph collected all the money that was to be found in Egypt and Canaan in payment for the grain they were buying, and he brought it into Pharaoh's palace. When the money of the people of Egypt and Canaan were gone, all Egypt came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? Our money is used up. Then bring your livestock, said Joseph. I will sell sell you food in exchange for your livestock, since your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and he gave them food in exchange for their horses, their sheep and goats, their cattle and donkeys. And he brought them through that year with food in exchange for all their livestock. When that year was over, they came to him the following year and said, We cannot hide from our Lord the fact that since our money is gone and our livestock belongs to you, There is nothing left for our Lord except our bodies and our land. Why should we perish before your eyes, we and our land as well? Buy us and our land in exchange for food. And we with our land will be in bondage to Pharaoh. Give us seed so that we may live and not die, and that the land may not become desolate. So Joseph bought all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. The Egyptians, one and all, sold their fields because the famine was too severe for them. The land became Pharaoh's, and Joseph reduced the people to servitude. 
from one end of Egypt to the other. However, he did not buy the land of the priests because they received a regular allotment from Pharaoh and had food enough from the allotment Pharaoh gave them. That is why they did not sell their land. Joseph said to the people, Now that I have bought you and your land today for Pharaoh, here is seed for you so that you can plant the ground. But when the, crops, when the crop comes in, give a fifth of it to Pharaoh. The other four-fifths you may keep as seed for fields and as food for yourselves and your households and your children. You have saved our lives, they said. May we find favor in the eyes of our Lord. We will be in bondage to Pharaoh. So Joseph established it as a law concerning the land in Egypt, still in force today, that a fifth of the produce belongs to Pharaoh. It was only the land of the priests that did not become Pharaoh's. Now, now the Israelites settled in Egypt in the region of Goshen. They acquired property there and were fruitful and increased greatly in number. Jacob lived in Egypt 17 years, and the years of his life were 147. When the time drew near for Israel to die, he called for his son Joseph and said to him, If I have found favor in your eyes, put your hand under my thigh and promise that you will show me kindness and faithfulness. Do not bury me in Egypt, but when I rest with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt and bury me where they are buried. I will do as you say, he said. Swear to me, he said. Then Joseph swore to him, and Israel worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. There ends the reading of God's holy word at this time. And as always, we're dependent now on God the Holy Spirit, so let us pray for him to open up this passage to us this morning. Our great God and our Heavenly Father, you are so good to us, your people. We are a people who live in a barren wasteland. We are a people who live in a world which is uh, in a famine filled with sin and rebellion. And Father, you have delivered us as your own. And now, Father, we come before you this on your Lord's Day, asking that you would feed our hungry souls, that you would satisfy our hearts. Father, this morning, speak to your ser- through your servant. We ask, the Lord, that the words that we are about to hear would come directly from you, that that God the Holy Spirit would bless the preaching of the Word, that that we would not only comprehend the truth of this passage, but that He would write the application of it upon all of our hearts this morning, and that Christ would receive all of the glory. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, one of the roles of fathers, of course, is being a provider for our families. Uh, Fathers, of course, have a diverse needs, a diverse uh, set of uh, work that they are called to do, Uh, but one of the things that we know about fathers is they're called to be the providers. They're called to provide for their wives and their children. And if you think about it, by way of example this morning, the relationship fathers have with their children is different with children that are not their own. Uh, When I was growing up, there were a number of times I was invited over to a friend's house, and of course, when the friend would invite me for a snack or when we were invited to the table, Uh, the family would always provide food. But when I went home, that obligation to provide food obviously went away. But the father, my friend's father, still had the obligation to provide for his children. And of course, we know the reason why. Our children come with an obligation for, as fathers, to provide for them, to give all that we can to meet their needs. We're not obligated to provide for any other children other than our own. If we have someone who comes in our home as a guest, of course, we provide, but once they leave, that obligation goes away. And that is the exact image that I want you to have in your mind as we go through the text this morning, because the text this morning, the one that we just read, is really all about God as Father. Uh, The text is about how God provides for His children because they are His own. He has bound Himself to them. For the people of Israel, God has said, you are my own, and come what may, I promise, I will provide for you even in the midst of the worst famine. And in our text, we see really two different levels of provision. We see God providing for His people in abundance. They have food, they have land, and by the end of the text, we are told they're fruitful that they multiply, that they are given property that belongs to them. And all the while they're getting that, you notice that God also is providing for the Egyptians, to people who do not love Him, to people who are not His own. And yet you notice, as we read the text, the Egyptians, while they are provided for, are not provided for as from a father. 
because they do not have God as their father, as the Israelites do. And therefore, by the end of the text, the Egyptians who serve false gods wind up being enslaved by Pharaoh, whereas the Israelites are free and are filled with bounty because they have God as their father. The point of the text is to show us God brings blessing to his covenant people. And in many ways, this text grounds us in chapter 15. Ever since chapter 15, when God came to Abraham and covenanted with him, the promise has always been, those who bless you, Abraham, and bless your descendants, I will bless. And Abraham, I will be with you and your descendants. Wherever they may go, I promise to watch over them. And as Israel now comes to Egypt, that's exactly what we see. The Egyptians are provided for because they're blessing God's people. And yet, God makes very clear those whom are his children are blessed because they are in a different relationship with him. And so with that in mind, this is the theme that with God's help, I hope to show you from this large section of God's word this morning. We learn that God brings provision to Egypt for the sake of his people. God brings provision to Egypt for the sake of his people. And there are three stages in the text where we see God providing. Three stages of provision. First of all, we want to know the provision in the presentation. We're going to spend most of our time here, so don't panic if uh, we're a large section into the sermon and we haven't gotten the other two points yet. But we want to first of all look at the provision in the presentation as God uh, brings his people before Pharaoh. Secondly, we want to note the provision in purchasing. The provision in purchasing as the Egyptians purchased their food from Joseph. And then thirdly, and most briefly, looking at the provision in property. The property that God gives his people in Egypt. So those three things, provision and presentation, purchasing, and then finally property. So first of all, note with me now the provision in the presentation of Joseph and his whole family as they present themselves before Pharaoh. You notice that in chapter 46, verses 31 through 34, Joseph now is preparing his family for how they are to approach Pharaoh. We're reminded where we left off last week. Joseph now had finally met his father. It had been many, many years since he had last seen him. His father is now an elderly man. He's tested his brothers, and now in that very moment, the family has finally been reunited. They took all of their belongings, all of their family, and Joseph embraced his father for a long time with tears and weeping because God had brought the family together. But now Joseph stops, he wipes the tears from his eyes, he releases his embrace from his father, now he brings his brothers in for a little huddle, and he says, listen, we have one more step before we can settle in the land. You need to present yourselves before Pharaoh, and you need to present the request for him to give you a section of land that you can live in, and this is how we are going to do this. You notice the stages for the preparation. One... Joseph is going to introduce them. Now that's kind of an obvious practical benefit or practical step because Joseph, of course, is the contact man. He is the one whom God has sovereignly put on the throne as second in command. He is the one whom God has established to be the person, to, to be really be the mediator between Pharaoh and his family. And notice the second step. Joseph will inform Pharaoh that they took all their belongings, uh, that they are shepherds by trade, and that he left them in Goshen uh, before they came to meet with Pharaoh. And then Joseph looks his brothers no doubt in the eye and says, listen brothers, at this moment you need to do something that you're not really good at. You need to be honest with Pharaoh. You need to be honest about your trade, shepherds. We're going to note in a moment that shepherds were not highly viewed among Egyptians. But Joseph says, listen, you need to be honest about your shepherding, you need to be honest about your past, and only then bring the request before Pharaoh. Pharaoh. And you notice at the very end, what Joseph has in mind is to gain the land of Goshen. Now, the land of Goshen is a remote section. It's away from the larger cities of Egypt. And part of the reasons why Joseph wanted that was really for two reasons. One, it was very good land. It was flourishing land. It had the water of the Nile River around it, and therefore it was very fertile land, and Joseph knew his family would be well provided for there. But spiritually, Joseph had another reason in mind. Goshen was further removed from the larger cities, away from all of the wicked pagan idolatry, from all of the temple worship of their false gods, and Joseph wanted Goshen so that while God's people were there, there was a divide between God's people and the nations of the world. 
Joseph wanted this land so that his people would not fall under the influence, would not intermarry, would not be assimilated uh, with the unbelieving, unbelieving nation of the Egyptians. And there's one benefit in mind for this, and Joseph wants to use this to his advantage. We're told again that shepherds were detestable to the Egyptians. Now, nothing that I read this week could give an answer as to why this is. Many people speculate that it was foreign shepherds, but that's not really what the text says. It just simply says that for whatever reason, shepherds were detestable and, and the Egyptians would have wanted them far away. The point is, is Joseph is going to use this to his advantage to get God's people far away because shepherds were not favorable to the Egyptians. And so Joseph now prepares his brothers for the face-to-face encounter. And that's the next step of the presentation. You notice in chapter 47, verses 1 through 4, uh, Joseph takes five of his brothers and he brings them into the throne room of the Pharaoh and they follow his plan to a T. Joseph introduced them, he tells them about his brothers, and then Pharaoh speaks to the brothers and asking them about their occupation. And they're honest, they say, we are shepherds and our fathers have been shepherds, this has been a lifelong occupation, we are wanderers from the land of Canaan. And notice verse 4 as they present their request. They also said to him, we have come to live here a while because the famine is severe in Canaan and your servants' flocks have no pasture. So now please let your servants settle in Goshen. Now that all of the the introductions have been made, now that Pharaoh has had his question answered, the brothers say, listen, we're really here for one reason. And you know the reason. The famine is so bad, there is no way we can live in Canaan. So we packed up everything that came here and Pharaoh, we're asking for generosity. We're asking for you to be merciful. Provide us a place for us to live. And one interesting detail, and the the translation, the NIV translation gets it very well here. The phrase that's translated to live here a while uh, is the word to be a sojourner, to be a resident alien. Uh, What the brothers are saying is, listen, we're not trying to be permanent residents here. We're not going to take, we're not going to try to abuse the kindness, but we just want to have a temporary place where we can set up a temporary camp and just have residency here only as aliens. And all of this is going on, so they're demonstrating to Pharaoh, first of all, we're not going to try to take over. We're not going to try to invade. We're simply here temporarily. And emphasizing they don't want to abuse his kindness. And they present the request for the land of Goshen. And you notice, if you have your copy of God's Word open, the verses that follow, Pharaoh has been gracious to them. And he grants their request. The best part of the land, Pharaoh says, is yours. All of Egypt is open to you, Joseph. Settle your family wherever it seems best. And then they actually get a job offer. You notice Pharaoh says, listen, if any of your brothers are really good at their trade, why don't you set them up in charge of my animals and have them rule over my servants in care of my flocks? And uh, you'd ask at this point, well, what is the point? Why do we need to know all of this interchange? Why do we need to know the steps taken? And here's the answer. We are seeing that Pharaoh is demonstrating graciousness because God's hand is on the scene. And up to this point, we have seen God's hand on every step of Joseph's life. Uh, When he was living in Potiphar's house, what happened? God blessed the house because of Joseph. When Joseph was in the dungeon, what happened? God blessed Joseph and he blessed the ruler of the dungeon. Why? Because God was making a point, wherever my people go, I will bring blessing. And once again, God is showing covenant faithfulness. When his children walk into that Pharaoh's throne room, God is demonstrating once again, he is behind it completely. It is God's faithfulness which grants them the blessing of residing in the nation of Egypt. And then the third scene of presentation is really the, the biggest scene here. You notice finally once the brothers are excused, Joseph now brings his father Jacob in. And this is where we have a meeting between Jacob and Pharaoh. Uh, what's interesting here, it's really just not a meeting between two men, but what we have here is a meeting between two heads of nations. We have the head of the nation of Israel, the people of God, those who have the covenant promises And you have the head of the Egyptians, who at this time was the most powerful nation in the world. 
And what's interesting, what should stand out to you and me as really a shocking thing, is that Jacob is allowed to actually bless Pharaoh. And he doesn't bless Pharaoh once, you notice he actually blesses Pharaoh twice. Pharaoh permits this elderly man, this elderly pilgrim, to stand over him with his hands raised and to pronounce a blessing from his God over Pharaoh. Now the reason this is remarkable, because in this tradition, in this culture, to be the one who blesses is to be the superior. If you're the one doing the blessing, you are demonstrating that when your hands are raised, you are pronouncing something as one who's in a superior office to the one you are standing over. And that is exactly what happens in the throne room of Pharaoh. A Pharaoh receives a blessing twice from the hands of Jacob, the instrument of God who's been set there. And you notice the reason that Jacob is a superior in this case is because he's the only one in the room who has a relationship with the true and living God. Jacob is the superior. Jacob doesn't own a, a plot of land other than the two pieces of land in the promised land. Uh, Jacob does not have a large nation. He came with 70 descendants with servants and the like. And yet compared to Pharaoh, he is far greater. Why? Because he knows the true and living God. He has a relationship with the God of heaven and earth. And therefore, in this remarkable scene, he stands over Pharaoh and grants a blessing. And in the midst of this, you notice there's an interesting question. Pharaoh asks what in our culture could be an offensive question, but not in this culture. You notice he asks Jacob, how old are you? Now, part of the reason of this is because in Egyptian culture, they really prized elderly age. It's part of the reasons why they, they had mummies, and it's why they, they had all of this afterlife, because they viewed people with elderly age, with high dignity, honor, and privilege, and I suppose really throughout history, that's really been mostly the case, where the elders of the people were viewed with honor. And so Pharaoh asked the question, how old are you? And behind the question, he's asking, how blessed are you? How good has your God been to you in giving you a long life? And you notice at this time, notice Jacob's response in verse 9. And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my pilgrimage have been 130 years. My years have been few and difficult. They do not equal the years of pilgrimage of my father's. Then Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. Now Jacob says a couple of puzzling things here in response. He doesn't simply give an answer that he's uh, of such a high age, but you notice what he says. First of all, he says, I'm simply a pilgrim. I stand before you. I'm the one who's blessing you, but you need to realize I'm just a wanderer. My father and my grandfather have been a wanderer. We've been promised something. We haven't received that yet. But I'm simply a pilgrim who's lived as a wanderer on this earth. And you notice the second thing he says is that his years are few compared to his father's. Now, we would say, Jacob, now, aren't you kind of exaggerating here? You're 130-something years old. I would say you've lived a good long while. What's going on here? Uh, some people think Jacob is falling into his sin of complaining here. Some people think that, that Jacob is, is kind of whining about his years, but I really don't think so. We do know that Jacob is a complainer. Maybe there's a little of that here. But I doubt Jacob, standing in front of Pharaoh, is taking this opportunity to whine about how his grandfather and grandfather lived to a far older age than he is at that moment. I think here's the point. Jacob is saying, listen, I'm living for something different than you. I follow the true and living God. He has promised me land. He's promised me a nation. Yes, he's given me old age, but it's nothing compared to my father's. But I'm living for something beyond this life. I'm living for the things which you cannot see because I live and walk by faith and not by sight. And the reason I think that is because the third thing he says, you notice that he says the years of his life have been filled with difficulty, with trials, with sins and challenges. And that, in many ways, is an understatement. We've seen that Jacob has lied and was kicked out of his family for a number of years. He had a number of challenges. He had children who were sinful, who had done a number of things. And what Jacob is, again, reminding Pharaoh, I'm living for something other than this life. My life in following God has brought me the trials. It has brought me difficulty. But I'm living by faith because my life, my hope, extends beyond the riches of what this world has to offer. I think here's the point. Jacob is using this time to witness to Pharaoh about the hope of what it is to live by faith. He has a God who lives and reigns. He has the promises of this God. 
But it's almost as if he's saying, Pharaoh, don't look on the circumstances of my life to know how blessed I am. Because the blessings that I have are spiritual. The blessings that I have go to eternity, not the things that you prize. And I would say there's a lesson there for you and I this morning if you are a believer. If you are a believer here this morning, there's a sense in which you and I can go to the watching world and we can say, listen, the blessings that I have are things you cannot see. You live, unbeliever, for the things of this world. You live for the food and the clothing and for the enjoyment of this world, but I am living for something different. I am following a God who has held a promise of everlasting life. I am following a God who has dealt with my sin. And yes, my life may be filled with many sufferings. It is because my life is in pursuit of a God who gave me eternal life. You see, there's a really remarkable sense, believer, this morning that that like Jacob, we can stand in front of a watching world, people who are wealthier than you and I, people who are more powerful than you and I. And if they do not know the Lord God as Father, there's a sense in which we stand over them and they say, we have been blessed far beyond what we can display before you. That is what the joy it is to be a believer. And Jacob is witnessing to Pharaoh of the life of a believer. And, I, and to put it all together now, you'd say, okay, what's the point of this story. I think the point is to show that God has sovereignly prepared all things, and before Pharaoh himself is showing, he is a faithful father to his people who are trusting in him. And actually, look at your text again. Notice that's how the, the story ends here, or this, this point ends. Look at verse 11. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers in Egypt and gave them property in the best part of the land, the district of Ramses, as Pharaoh directed. Joseph also provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to the number of their children. Now I highlight that verse because in a few moments we're going to see it's not that way with the citizens of Egypt. But here what we see by the end of the throne room scene is, as Joseph and Jacob and their five brothers go to Goshen, they go and they have abundance in food. Here's the point. The only explanation for that is because of God. It is Israel and Israel alone at this very moment in history, in this very land of Egypt, they're the only ones who have God as their father, and God is the one who has given it to this, uh, given it to them. In the midst of starvation, it is God who has provided. And, and in many ways, there's a contrast here. God is showing that he is the true God. All the false gods of the Egyptians are not hearing the cries of their worshipers because they are not God. But the true and living God has provided abundantly for his children. So that's the first point. Notice, second, with, secondly now, notice the provision now in purchasing. The provision now in purchasing. God does provide for another group of people here. But you notice they have to purchase the blessing. Notice uh, the Egyptians in their circumstance. Look at verse 13. It says, there was no food, however, in the whole region because the famine was severe, both Egypt and Canaan wasted away because of the famine. Joseph collected all the money that was to be found in Egypt and Canaan in payment for grain they were buying, and he brought it to Pharaoh's palace. Uh, the text picks up now in direct contrast to the Israelites. You notice it is getting far worse for the rest of the Egyptians. The famine is going on. There has been no food. There's been no rain. And now they've spent all of their money, all of their life savings, all of their bank accounts are empty. They have nothing to show for. And guess what? There's been yet no harvest again for another year. They are hopeless and unable to provide for themselves financially. Really one image you and I need to keep in mind as we come to this text is the image of all of the famines that, that hit nations within Africa. And no doubt you and I have seen pictures of starving, skinny little children, especially in places like Somalia. Even right now, they're going through a famine. They have no hope. They have no food. And little children are in danger of wasting away. That is exactly what's happening as the parents in Egypt are looking at their children. What are they going to do? Well, you notice, there is hope. Joseph has a means of providing for their starving families. First of all, you notice Joseph opens and welcomes them to purchase food through their livestock. They've given all their money, and so Joseph says, listen, take your animals here. I will purchase food. I will exchange food with you for these animals. 
Uh, and just consider, by the way, that they had no means of even feeding these animals, and so there's a sense in which Joseph is being merciful both to the animals and to the owners of the animals. Joseph said, listen, I'll be gracious. Give me your animals in exchange for your livestock. I will give you and your family food, and I will ensure that you do not starve to death for another year. And it goes on. Notice in the verses that follow, the famine is not over the following year, and so the people need to come back to Joseph and say, listen, we can't hide it from you. You got everything. You got all of our money. You have all of our livestock, and we're about to starve, starve to death again. What are we going to do? So the suggestion is now to sell everything they have. They want to sell their land and even themselves in order to work the land unto Pharaoh. And so that's exactly what Joseph does. He now purchases all of the land except the land of the priests because we're told here that Pharaoh has given them an allotment. And so Joseph now is selling some of the grain to these people. All of their storehouses now are slowly dwindling and all of the property rights are coming in and Joseph now is purchasing all of Egypt, and all of the Egyptians for Pharaoh. And then finally, the next year, you notice what happens when these people have sold everything to them. Look at verse 23 and 24. Joseph said to the people, now that I have bought you and your land today for Pharaoh, here is seed for you so that you can plant the ground. When the crop comes in, give, give a fifth of it to Pharaoh. The other four fifths you may keep as seed for fields and as food for yourselves and your households and your children. Joseph now says, listen, I've purchased you, and I've purchased your land. Here is seed now, and from here on out, since I own everything, or Pharaoh rather owns everything, when you plant your fields and when you harvest, 20% of all that you harvest is going to immediately go unto Pharaoh, and you are allowed to keep the remainder uh, for your storehouses, for the future planting, and to feed your family. By the end of the story, the people's lives are spared. God's man, Joseph, has provided for them so they did not die. But by the end of the story, all that they were trusting in, all that they were depending on prior to the famine, is gone, and their very lives belong to Pharaoh. Now, one thing to pr properly understand the passage is notice the attitude of these people. Do they grumble about this? Do they tell Joseph, you're being a tyrant? How dare you do this to us? Actually, no, look at verse 23, or rather 25. This is what the Egyptians say. You have saved our lives, they said, and we find favor in the eyes of our Lord. We will be in bondage to Pharaoh. We notice by the end of the story, the Egyptians are actually thanking Joseph for his provision that he spared their life. Uh, by the end of the famine, by what the Egyptians now have become, or what we call in our culture, sharecroppers. Pharaoh owns everything, and now he has employed them to give 20%, and they have gained their lives, and they've gained a future for their families. And so they demonstrate thankfulness and praise in light of all this. But now we need to ask a question. What is the point of this text? What is the point to this detailed exposition of everything that was happening in Egypt? Why do you and I this morning need to know the end result of the Egyptians and how they were purchased completely? And I think there's really three reasons why this text is in your Bible. First reason this morning, the purchase, uh, purpose of the purchasing, is really, to, first of all, to show that the gods of Egypt were powerless. That's exactly what we learn here. Prior to the famine, what were these people worshiping? They were worshiping the gods of the Nile, the gods of the sun. They were worshiping things which are not gods. Uh, what did we see a couple weeks ago when we looked at Psalm 115? To worship anything other than the true and living God is to worship something that is powerless. That is exactly what these people were living for. They're trusting their hands. They're trusting their money. They were looking to the things of this world to provide for their future. What happened after seven years of famine? Their gods were humiliated. They were shown trusting in money is futile. Trusting in the things of this world will leave you empty. Why? Because there's only one true God. It's the God of Joseph. The gods that you serve are powerless. Their ears are deaf to your cries. They are not gods. They are worthless. Uh, what's even remarkable is that in this day, or throughout all of Egypt's history, Pharaoh was actually considered to be a god. They viewed him as the son of Ra, the sun god. And yet as he sits on his throne, still thinking he's a god, 
He is powerless to help his people. Behold the foolishness of worshiping anything other than the true and living God. Second reason we need to know this is we see the character of God towards unbelievers here. We see the character of God in that he is merciful to unbelievers. What does Jesus say in the Gospel of Matthew? God causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. What does God do to those who hate him? In this life, God shows extreme mercy by even providing for their physical needs. People who hate him, people who rejected him, people who do not know him or want to know him, what does God do? Well, he provides for them. The text shows us God's compassion even to unbelievers. But the third reason, I think this is the big reason that this is in your Bibles this morning, is to show that the Egyptians do not have a father. The Egyptians do not have a father who will care for them like the Israelites. That's the point. What is Israel doing while the Egyptians are selling everything? They're eating. They're living. They're flourishing. Why? Because they have a father who cares for them. The Egyptians do not have a father. They are orphans living in this world using their own wits to get by. The Israelites are thriving as pilgrims because they have a father in heaven who loves them, who sees their needs, and does what it takes to provide for them. The Egyptians do not. Here's the point. God blesses the Egyptians with food, but not as a father. He blesses them with provisions only because his people are present there, as he had promised to do in Genesis 15. And therefore, we see the difference between having a father and not having him as father. But thirdly, and lastly, notice the last scene here is now the provision in property. The Egyptians now were given a statement here, or the Israelites rather, uh, were given a statement now on their condition. Look at verse 27. Now the Israelites settled in Egypt in the region of Goshen. They acquired property there and were fruitful and increased greatly in number. The Israelites were given property. They were given land. They were given food. And verse 27 is meant to contrast everything and note here God's people are flourishing and they are multiplying. Now those words, if you've been here throughout the entire Genesis story, if you've read Genesis, should have a tone of echo in your ear. Where else have we heard the language of multiplying and flourishing? We saw that back in Genesis 1 and 2. What was the command to Adam and Eve? Go forth, have dominion over all creation, be fruitful and multiply. Additionally, what did God promise Abraham? I will make a nation out of you. I will grow you to be a large people to the point where stars in the sand of the sea, you would not be able to count them. What we see here is that in the midst of this famine and the years that follow, God has provided so much so that his people are able to be faithful to their commission. They're being fruitful. They are multiplying. And all of this is due to God's grace. And the last scene here to note in verses 28 and 31, or 28 through 31, uh, Jacob now has been in Egypt for 17 years, and he calls Joseph before him on his deathbed. And we have this scene here where he makes Joseph swear to him that he will not bury him in Egypt, but will actually bury him in the promised land. And in the coming chapters, we're going to see more of this. But why is this so important to Jacob? Why must he be buried in the promised land? And, and here's the point. Jacob is saying, I'm a man who has lived by faith all my years, and I'm a man who's going to die by faith. I'm going to take my last breath resting in the promises of God that while I have not seen this, God will give my descendants exactly what he promised. And Jacob is saying, I want that to be witnessed not only where my body is buried, uh, you must take my bones and bury them in the promised land. And you notice here, he forces Joseph to swear because he is a man of faith and he will die in faith. He'll be buried in the promised land as a demonstration that he believes in all of God's promises. And so here's a point in the work towards conclusion this morning. From beginning to end, the text is teaching us that Jacob and Joseph and the people of God are people who live by faith and rest in a father who cares for them. Uh, in Hebrews 11, really, which teaches us the application of this, we learn that Jacob and Abraham and Isaac were people who lived by faith looking to a better city, a city whose foundations and builder were built by God. There were men who lived by faith, not by sight. And therefore, we see they trusted in a God who is their father. Now, 
in conclusion, as we come to the end of this lengthy text, what is the application this morning? And there are two things that I want to kind of wrap this up in and, and leave you with this morning. First of all, and this is the big one, this text teaches you and me this morning that it is the greatest of all privileges, it is the greatest, is the greatest of all blessings to have God as our Father. You see, that is the point. Who would you want to be in the text by the end of it? Do you want to be the Egyptians who just get by because they're able to scrape to get by? Or do you want a God who hears your prayers? Do you want to get by and just enjoy this world and die? Or do you want to have a Father who loves you and cares for you even beyond this world? And you see, from the point of the text, God is saying, I am a good Father. And if you know me as your Father, you have been blessed beyond compare. What has your Father done for you if you are a believer here this morning? Well, just think about how God has been good to you. Our Father has sent His Son to be the bread of life to feed our hungry souls. He provided abundantly to Israel, and so He's provided abundantly to you and me by sending His Son. Our Father has sent His Son to be living water to satisfy our thirsting souls. And I would say even more than that, our Father has sent His Son to be the greater and better Joseph to prepare a place for us to bring us to Him and to provide a home for us. This morning, we are reminded that in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we, God has shown He is the greatest of all fathers. He has brought to us, as we live in the famine and the wasteland of this world, the greatest of all blessings. Let me ask you a personal question this morning. Do you know God as your personal father this morning? And, and I want to make very clear, not that you just know God as God. That's one thing. Many people can claim, oh, I know God. I'm a spiritual person. That's not the question. Do you know God as Father? How do you know God as Father this morning? Only through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Only through faith and repentance, crying out, running into His arms is the only way you can call God as your Father. There are many people living around us who are spiritual people, but do not know God as Father. They are no different than the Egyptians living with nothing. Do you know God as your Father this morning? Have you run into His arms through the work of Jesus Christ? Have you experienced his fatherly care knowing his oversight in your life? Let me point this out. Believer, if that is true of you, you and I have it so good. And you know, a couple of weeks ago, my boys and I were watching a documentary, and there was an interview in that documentary of a guy who converted to Christianity in Iran. And in Iran, you know that if you convert to Christianity, it's the death penalty. And he was just telling the story in the interview how he converted, he found a Bible, and immediately when he told someone he was put in prison, they beat him so bad that to this day he cannot raise his arms above his head. Every one of his ribs were broken, and by the end of his imprisonment, his own uncle paid to put an end to his life to bring honor back to his family. And some Christians in Britain found out about this, they petitioned the government, they brought him back to uh, to uh, Britain, and to this day, he is preaching the gospel wherever he can go. And the interview asked him, why do you continue to preach? You've lost everything. You don't even have a father anymore. Your own family wants to put you to death. Why would you do this? You know what his answer was? I'm not an orphan anymore. I have a father. He says, you know, every moment they were beating me in prison, why did I not recant? It's because I had a father who was watching over me. And he says, I have a burden for everyone in Islam. Why? They're orphans. They don't have a father. And it's the burden of me to share with everyone to know there is a God in heaven who will love you as a father. Oh, Christian, this morning, that is your privilege and my privilege. We're not orphans. We go throughout this life knowing a father who cares for us like that. And the second thing, and more briefly, I want to end with this. The application as we come to the Lord's table this morning is that we also, like Jacob, live by faith in the future. Uh, this is a meal that reminds us that we are family. It's around a table. Why? We have God as our Father. Our elder brother serves us this meal. We come to dine, to be fed by the body, the blood of Christ, the spiritual body and blood of Christ. But this is foreshadowing the great marriage supper of the Lamb, when we'll be raised with glorified bodies, when we will sit together with our Savior and dine in all glory. What a joy it is to be a Christian this morning. What a comfort it is to have a father who watches over us and has demonstrated his fatherly love. Amen. Let's pray. Our great God and our heavenly father, we pray, O oh Lord, and uh, work that truth in our hearts now.
We ask, O oh Lord, that for your children present here this morning, as we prepare our hearts to come to this table, remind us and refresh us in the joy it is to know you as our Father. And we ask, O oh Lord, that we would go now out into this watching world and demonstrate that comfort and that joy. We ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.